welcome to Central. I want to invite you to stand to your feet with us. Today we are celebrating. We're celebrating all that Christ has done for us before and what He's continuing to do in us and in our community. We have those who have made a decision to get baptized today. We're certainly going to celebrate them and their testimony. But let's begin our time together by worshiping our Savior. It is by grace we are saved. Let's sing. We worship the God who was. We worship the God who is. We worship the God who evermore will be. He opened the prison doors. He parted the raging seas. My God, He holds the victory.
of God that this is our story, that this is our testimony, that we come from death into life, that we have new life. And I think it's really important. I want to read this passage to us from Ephesians chapter 2 before we take our, our next opportunity to celebrate with our friends in baptism. Ephesians chapter 2 says this, because of his great love for us, God who is rich in mercy made us alive with Christ even when we were dead in transgression. It is by grace we have been saved. And God raised us up with Christ and seated us with him in the heavenly realms in Christ Jesus in order that in the coming ages he might show the incomparable riches of his grace expressed in his kindness to us in Christ Jesus. For it is by grace we have been saved. It is by grace we have been saved through faith. And this is not from ourselves. It is the gift of God. Not by works so that no one can boast. For we are God's handiwork created in Christ Jesus to do good works which God prepared in advance for us to do. And so we do, we celebrate with our friends who are taking that next step of faith in the water of baptism today, but I just wanna remind us that this is our testimony as much as it is theirs. That it is not by our own strength, by our own will, or by our own power that we have salvation or that we find new life. It is only by the grace it is only by the grace and the power of Jesus Christ that we are now called children of God. So I just wanna sing out this chorus together as we get ready to celebrate with our friends. We're gonna to testify to the grace of God in their life this morning. Let's sing together. I've tried so hard to see it took me so long to believe it That you choose someone like me To carry your victory Perfection could never earn it You give what we don't deserve it The broken things and you 
blessing to be here on a day we get to celebrate young men and women who have chosen to follow God with their lives, take the next step in their faith and being open to the world who they serve. Baptism itself, of course, isn't what saves us. Christ's sacrifice alone does that. We enter the water sinners and we come out wet sinners. But today, we get to celebrate the announcement of belonging, of salvation, and of loyalty to our loving Creator and Father. Today we have a chance to hear from my friend Trevor, who's joining me in the waters of baptism today, and is going to share what God has been doing in his life. My name is Trevor Davis. My walk with God has definitely been a journey, and it's been a journey I'm glad that I have walked. It hasn't been easy, but it's definitely been amazing. From the point of losing everything in my life, all the way to abusing drugs and alcohol every day, God has helped me find my way back into the loving arms of family and friends. Today I have decided to make the next step of my faith, and that is to be baptized, but I have not decided to do it alone. I have walked alone thinking I could do this by myself for years, and I have recently been attending Celebrate Recovery as well as Life's Healing Choices. One thing I have learned is that I have to let go and let God. If it wasn't for my family and friends, I truly don't think I would be where I am today. I have treated my family with so much disrespect when I was lost in my ways of a sinner, and yet my family has brought me back into their home more times than I can count because they have never lost faith in me, and that taught me that I can never lose faith in Jesus Christ. I am here today to say I have sinned several times, and I will continue to sin because that's what makes me human, but I come here today to ask God to heal me from my sinful ways. And I come here today to show him my unconditional love, praying that he will do the same today, tomorrow, and forever. Amen. Thank you, Trevor. I want you to know, look out in this room, this is a group of people who are offering their unconditional love to you. Thank you. I've got a few questions for you, brother. Okay. All right. Have you chosen to accept Jesus Christ as your personal Lord and Savior? Absolutely. And do you endeavor all the days of your life to follow him to the best of your ability? Absolutely. All right. Well, Trevor, then in the public profession of your faith, it is my blessing to baptize you in the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Buried with him in his death and raised with him to new life. Joining me now is my brother and fellow tenor, Andy. He's yes, going to share sir. a story with you today. <laughs> Tenors got to stick together. That's right. Uh, so I grew up in a Christian home, um, attending every week and serving in our church when I can. Um, my mom always used to take us. And uh, it, was, it was one of those churches that did infant baptism. Uh, and my parents made that decision for me. My teenage years brought me to summer camp where I truly met Jesus, had an encounter with him, and my life was changed. Uh, I stumbled through my high school years, hiding my faith more than developing it. My senior year was when my parents were divorced. A new chapter in life brought us to a new church, this time a Baptist church that practiced adult baptism. So my brother and I attended with my mom, but my heart really wasn't in it. She eventually decided that she wanted to get baptized, and it would be so special if the three of us did it together. Jaded and angry as I was, I went along with it to appease my mom. God spent the next 20 years nudging me, opening doors, and asking if I'd follow him into where they led. Many times I did, sometimes I didn't, and sometimes I tried to make my own way. But things were always better when you follow where he leads. Jobs, kids, moving, even how I served in the church. And then in August, Corey preached about, or before the outdoor baptism, and after that message, God nudged me again. 
Andy, the first time was your parents' decision. The second was to make your mom happy. Are you ready to make that decision for, your, for yourself? I'm ready, not for anyone's sake but my own. I, need to, I wanna get baptized in obedience to God and for all he's done in my life and the immeasurable love he's shown to me. Well, Andy, I've got two questions for you. All right. Spoiler alert, you know the answers already. So yes. Just, okay. Have you chosen to make Jesus Christ your personal Savior and Lord? I have. And do you endeavor to the best of your ability to follow him all the days of your life. I do. And sing his praises even when you can't sing. Amen. Awesome. Amen. All right, amen to that. But based on your public profession of faith, Andy, it is my blessing to baptize you in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. Buried with him in his death. And raised to new life. Woo! Smaller stature does not mean smaller faith, just so you all know. That's good. Everybody, this is my friend Sammy, and she's going to share her story with you. I became a Christian on June 18, 2022 at a rodeo. When we have been reading, of, reading about Moses and how God provided for the people, I want to be baptized, to get baptized, because I know that God will provide for me, always. Um, my favorite um, worship song um, is Waymaker. Whenever we sing it, I sing it super good, because I stay in my mind. Amen. Welcome down here. Can I come down here? Is that cool? I can confirm she does sing it super loud, and it makes me cry just about every time. To hear young men and women singing the truth that God is their way maker is just about the greatest thing. <laughs> Sammy, it's so awesome to be here. I'm so proud of you, kiddo. I've got two questions for you, okay? Have you accepted Jesus Christ into your heart as your personal Lord and Savior? And you promise to do the best you can to follow him all the days of your life. Yes. Awesome. Well, Sammy, then, based on your public profession of faith, it's my blessing to baptize you in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. Buried with him in his death and raised to new life. Big brother Lincoln here, who's also with us, being faithful and getting baptized today. Lincoln, can you share your story, brother? I love Jesus since I can remember. My favorite Bible story is when Ezekiel watched God bring the dry bones back to life. I love Jesus and I know that he is my only. I want to show my love for him by getting baptized. I want to show God's love to the world because some people don't know God. That's awesome, Lincoln. Thank you, buddy. There is no better motivation for choosing to show the world you're a child of God than their love, than your love for the world. And that's super clear. Thank you so much, bud. I've got two questions for you, too. Okay? Have you chosen to accept Jesus Christ as your personal Lord and Savior? Yes. And do you endeavor with all your heart, mind, soul, and strength to follow him all the days of your life? Yes. And Lincoln, it is based on the profession of your faith. It's my blessing 
to baptize you in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. Buried with him in his death. Raised to new life in him. Carson is going to share God's story of his life for us this morning. Hi, my name is Parson, and I'm 11 years old. I accepted Jesus in my heart when I was six years old. I am growing up in a Christian home, and I'm thankful for my mom, dad, Pastor Ethan, and Pastor Nick for helping me grow my faith. God has helped me through moving and changing schools. He let me know that I was not alone and even though things are different, that he will never change. I am thankful to have God in my heart, to know that he's always with me. My favorite scripture is Deuteronomy 4.35. The Lord showed you those things so that you might know that he is God. There is no other thing God except him. I want to get baptized today to tell the world that Jesus is my Lord and Savior. Awesome, Parson. So good. So good. All right, Parson, on behalf of Ethan and I, it's an honor to be in the water with you today, brother. Glad I can be a part of this. Do you believe that Jesus Christ is your Lord and Savior, that he died for your sins on the cross and rose from the grave three days later? Yes. Awesome, Parson. Through the power of the Holy Spirit at work within you, do you say no to sin and the ways of this world and yes to Christ and Christ alone from this day forward? Yes. Awesome, Parson. Based on your public profession of faith, it is our honor to baptize you in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, becoming like Christ in his death. And raise a new life, brother. Yes, sir. Proud of you. Proud of you. Congratulations. Joining us now is Christian and his small group leader for life, whether he knows it or not, Jake Walters. Christian, would you share with your church family what God has been up to in your life, brother? Yes, as Nick has already said, I am Christian. I'm 14 years old and I've attended Central my whole life. I accepted Jesus when I was in kindergarten one day after being picked up from school early. I had gotten in trouble during recess. My mother, who I dearly love and, and look up to, sat me down on the couch after we got home from school that day. After a long talk, I accepted Jesus into my life. Following this, I lived knowing the idea of Christian faith and tried to stick by it. It never fully settled on me that Christianity wasn't just about trying to live a certain way, but it was about a new way of life through Jesus. When I was in seventh grade, my small group leader, Jake, left to start going to church with his family. Jake poured so much time and effort into me, but the message he was trying to get through to me never made sense until he left. After all the conversations we had, I finally realized that Jake and many other people were trying to teach me that believing in Jesus was the way of life, and not just an idea. I look up to Jake a lot and decided I wanted to live like him. Not to get sucked up into the way of the world, to be honest, and most of all, live how Jesus would live. Over the past year, I've tossed and turned with the idea of baptism. When I heard there was baptism this Sunday, I was like, cool. <laughs> <laughs> Last Sunday, when I was in night, one of the leaders there gave an awesome message on how to put your identity and trust in Jesus and Jesus alone. It was then after the message, with a lot of thought, I decided I wanted to take the next step in faith and show the world what I put my faith, my life, and my identity in by getting baptized. As said in Ecclesiastes 3, 1-2, there's a time for everything and a season for every activity under the heavens, a time to be born and a time to die. I believe there is a time to be baptized in the name of Jesus, and there's a time to baptize others in the name of Jesus. Today, I just feel as if it was for me, my time to be baptized. Awesome, Christian. Proud of you, brother. That's what it's all about, Jake. Sure. <laughs> Christian, a couple questions for you, brother. Yeah. It's been a long time coming. Glad to be here with you today. Yeah. Do you believe that Jesus Christ is your Lord and Savior? That he died for your sins on the cross and rose from the grave three days later? Yes. Awesome. 
through the power of the Holy Spirit at work within you, will you say no to sin and the ways of this world and yes to Christ and Christ alone from this day forward? Yes. Awesome, awesome Christian. Based on your public profession of faith, it is Jake and I's honor to baptize you in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, becoming like Christ in his death and raised to new life, brother. declare these words in worship. Father, we come in this very moment to praise you, the one who has conquered it all, the one who just gave us a, a glorious example in the waters of baptism of freshly redeemed lives, something that's available to every person everywhere. Because of the cross of Jesus, God's amazing love for us that he would give his son, that whoever believed in him could have everlasting life. What an amazing God you are. We worship you, Father. Receive our worship and praise. And we pray for our friends. We pray for those that are here this morning. Father, give rest to the weary. Give comfort to the dying. Give healing and comfort to the sick. Father, walk alongside those that are carrying the burden of grief today. May they feel the warmth of your presence. That even though they walk through the valley of the shadow of death, they can fear no evil, for you have promised to be with them and with us. So we pray for the family of Pam Kaufman this morning, who are in that very valley. We ask that you would comfort them, our friends. 
Father, for each of us this day, we know that we need to be reminded of the gift of the cross. We need to confess our sins and be, be reminded that in fact, everything in our lives can be crucified with Christ and that we no longer live, but the life that we live in our bodies, we live by faith in the Son of God who has loved us and given himself for us. We love you, Father. Receive our worship and we pray this in Jesus' name, amen. Well, welcome all of you and welcome those of you who are joining us online. So great to have you here. What, a, what an amazing testimony of God's goodness and baptism. I just love those stories. It's so good. If you're new with us today, a couple things we want to we want to remind you of or maybe inform you about is if you would like to make uh, get a conversation started with us, you can text us at 94,000 and just write the word Central Holland and that'll start a little dialogue back and forth. Or if you want to use the QR code on the back of your pews, you can just, I just found this out. You don't actually have to take a picture. You just have to hold it there. It, I just discovered this has a flashlight too. Um, <laughs> but if you hold it up there, it'll give you all the information you need about the events that are happening around Central. And it's a great way for you to get kind of an instant download on what's happening. If you want to look at numbers and other things that we normally have put in our bulletin, it's all there. Just figure out how to use that. And uh, we'd like to get that information to you. You know, the last few weeks during the offering time, we've been talking about some of the amazing thing God, God does when we're obedient and we give in the ministries of this church and great evidence even here with, with the number of kids that are being impacted by, by the ministries that you help support. So thank you for that. But one of the things that is really clear if you're in the Old Testament is this idea that God has always sort of expected his people to come into worship not empty-handed, in other words, with something to give. And while that sacrificial system is, it was abolished in the person of Jesus who kind of forgave us all, who kind of made it all, the relationship with God something that we could be secure in, the fact that coming to worship is something that, that is so vital in the history of God's people. Moses was giving a pep talk to the people of Israel before they went into the promised land in Deuteronomy, and he says, remember the manna in the desert? where God provided for you every single day so that you would trust him. And then when you begin to produce wealth with your own hands, don't forget the Lord your God. And so one of the motivations for giving is worship, is to worship a God who has given us everything. And more and more, that's our prayer for you. I, I, I so want you to experience what it means to be so filled with God's goodness and so aware of his many blessings that everything we bring, our singing, our prayers, evidence of his mercy and baptism, but our, our giving as well as an act of worship. So thank you as you supported our church and may God grow in you as he, I pray that he grows in me, a desire to worship him through giving. Well, we're in a series called Verses and before I kind of get to that, I just have to do a true confession. Craig and I are wearing the exact same shirt today. We don't know how that happened. Um, I just went in and asked for a Craig Reese starter kit, and this is what they gave me. <laughs> I told them, I'm going to have to do what my daughter used to do in middle school, which is every, every day before school, she would text all her friends and say, so what are you wearing? So now Craig and I are going to be on that text stream. Uh, I, I've so enjoyed Craig, not only Craig to, during this series, but I, I have an office that's right next to him. And I can tell when a message is is he's feeling the burden of it. And I, I can tell you, he's felt the burden of this particular message. And he just, just to be able to bring clarity and context for us, I think it's so valuable for us to kind of hear God's truth and, and superimpose that over the, the, the cultural issues that are going on. So I'm thrilled to have, have Craig lead us this morning. It'll be a great message on life versus choice. Thank you as you participate in that as well. Uh, let's get ready to rumble! The feature event of the evening. The hard hitting and the undefeated. Ladies and gentlemen, good evening and welcome. First, ladies and gentlemen, with a record of 29 wins, no losses. Here. You ready? I know exactly how we got the right shirt on, uh, the same shirt on, Mike. I listened to my wife. That's what, that's what happened. 
I, I woke up this morning and I, met, I said to Vicka, what shirt shall I wear today? And she's like, uh, why don't you wear that fall shirt? And I said, every time I put that on, Mike wears it. She says, come on, what's the chances of that? <laughs> hmm. Quite a lot, obviously. Uh, good morning, welcome to Central. We're in the series called Verses, and I get to talk about life versus choice, or what we could say, autonomy versus lordship, because that's ultimately what this uh, comes down to. Now, let me just uh, give a, a parental discretion advised uh, notice. We're talking about a mature theme today, so parents, just be aware of that. There's nothing explicit in the content, um, but I do want to just uh, point out that we are talking about the subject of life versus choice or abortion, so parents just feel comfortable with that. Now, as we get into this, uh, let me just say that the, uh, my objective is pretty clear here. I've said this before, that I believe that the Christian objective when it comes to abortion is not to make it impossible, but to make it unthinkable, okay? There's a fundamental difference between the two. I'm mindful that we're in a political season, and so I want to start with that. Um, our goal as believers, and my goal as a pastor, is basically to preach the Word, and when we preach the Word, the Word of God ultimately takes root in our heart, is alive in us, and ultimately produces the kind of behavior from the inside that glorifies Christ. It's the inside out, not the outside in. The law is powerless to change us. Romans chapter 8, verses 1 through 14, go read that. And so the goal of the Christian is always that the Word of the Gospel takes root in someone's heart, that ultimately results in a change of behavior. That's inside out. It's not outside in. And so that's why I say the goal uh, here is not to make abortion impossible. It's to make it unthinkable. Now, whenever I uh, tackle a, an issue like this, I, I use a conceptual framework uh, because I know that with contentious issues, there's so much to think about. And again, through this week, um, there's just been so much going on in my head that I'm like, how do, I, how do I distill this message, make it scriptural, make it make sense in the light of church history, um, and also make it practical? I'm mindful that when Roe versus Wade was overturned, a number of people said, wait a minute, we're getting rid of 50 years of established law. To which I was thinking, yeah, but wait a minute, you're overlooking 2,000 years of established doctrine. But many of us are not used to that. And so, like I did last week, what I'm going to do, I'm going to take us back into Scripture, I'm going to take us back into church history, and I'm going to try and apply this in a way that hopefully makes sense to you as you discern how you are the hands and feet of Jesus, bringing the hope of the gospel uh, to people, because when you bring the gospel, it will reorient the way people think and the way people behave but it'll do it from the inside out, not from the outside in. So I use a conceptual framework. I want to introduce you to that framework first of all, and then from there we're going to apply it to the abortion conversation. So this framework has three ideas, two or three concepts. The first one is this, what is clear and consistent? What is clear and consistent on this topic? The second one is, okay, what is inconsistent and needs to be talked about? And the third part of this is, okay, what is the exception here? What are the exceptions here that force people to evaluate where we draw the lines? So whenever I tackle a controversial theme, that's what I do. I ask, what's clear? What's not so clear? And what's the exception here that is forcing people to have the conversation? So let me, let me give you an example of this. Uh, uh, what's clear? Why? Because consistency actually leads to clarity. So when I'm asking what's clear, I'm asking what's consistently been the case here? Consistency and clarity. Now, let me give you an example from Scripture. The Bible says that God is holy. It says it from the beginning, and it says it right to the end. Consistently, we're told God is holy. So what do I know to be true? What I know to be true is that the Bible says that God is holy. Why? Because it's consistent. And because it's consistent, it's clear. Consistency leads to clarity. Uh, the second part of this framework for me is that inconsistency leads to conversation. If something's not so consistent and it's inconsistent, I need to ask questions about that. I need to try and figure out, okay, what is this thing actually saying to me? So let me give you an example. The example of the women at the tomb. 
Matthew and Luke say that when the women went to the tomb, to, uh, they went to uh, kind of minister to Jesus, the dead body, they experienced that he wasn't there. Matthew and Luke tells us that they tell us that they go and talk to the disciples. Mark tells us that they say absolutely nothing at all. Some people call that a contradiction. It's not a contradiction. It's an inconsistency. So when I encounter inconsistencies like that, I ask myself the question, okay, what do I need to understand from this? Why is this inconsistency there? What is the issue that's being addressed here that I need to deal with? Okay? Inconsistency always leads to conversation. Think about this in your own life. Parents, how many times have two of your kids or more if there's more of them arguing, well, I, I feel sorry for you. But how many times have our kids been arguing, and we ask one of them, so what happened? They tell us a story. We ask the other one, what happened? They tell us a different story, and you say, wait a minute, something isn't going right here. We need to what? We need to talk this through, right? Inconsistency always leads to us having a conversation to find out, okay, what's the point? Third part of this is that exceptions lead us to evaluate where we draw the lines, Exceptions lead us to evaluate where we draw the line. So the scriptural part of this is the reception of the Spirit. How do we receive the Holy Spirit? In Acts 2, in Acts 10, uh, in Acts 18, uh, Acts 19 rather, we actually see the Spirit being received immediately upon confession of faith. In Acts chapter 8, the story of the Samaritans, we see the Spirit being received after Peter visited the Samaritans to make sure that they were really saved. They'd already put their faith in Christ, but Acts 8 tells us they did not receive the Holy Spirit yet. That's an exception. So when you look at an exception that breaks an obvious pattern, you have to ask yourself, okay, how do I understand how believers receive the Spirit of God? And what we see historically and theologically is that this exception started the Pentecostal movement, the whole idea that the Spirit is received once, yes, but there is that second filling, okay? Does this kind of making sense to you? You're looking at me like I look at my wife when she takes me on a mystery date. <laughs> Where are we going, hon? Trust me. <laughs> yeah, right. But, but this, this actually really, really helps me think about controversial topics. It forces me to think about what's clear, what's not so clear, and what is the big deal here. So let's apply this whole idea, this whole framework to abortion. When we do that, what we see from the Scriptures all throughout church history is that abortion has always been presented by the church as wrong. It's clear, it's consistent. Let's start in the Bible. Let's go all the way back into Exodus chapter 21. Exodus 21, 22 through 25. If people are fighting and hit a pregnant woman and she gives birth prematurely, depending on your translation there, it may say has a miscarriage. Either way, there's usually a footnote here because it can be one or the other or both. Okay? But there is no serious injury. The offender must be fined whatever the, husband's, what the woman's husband demands and the court allows. But if there is serious injury, you are to take life for life, life for life. In the context of the Hebrew here, this refers to both the woman and the child that would have died through the serious injury, life for life. Eye for eye, tooth for tooth, hand for hand, foot for foot, burn for burn, wound for wound, bruise for bruise, life for life. In other words, the Hebrew Scriptures recognized the life of the child and actually granted justice to the, uh, to the family when that child, although still in the womb, died. Okay? So this is the idea of justice even applied to the unborn child, which is why Christians will talk about uh, abortion as a justice issue. There is, in our scriptural tradition, the right of justice for the unborn. Hopefully, some of you will now understand why we say that abortion is a justice issue, because we can track it right back to this. 
Let's move on. Happy a note, happy a scripture, Psalm 139. This is where a lot of you will go to, Psalm 139. For you created my inmost being, the psalmist says of God. You knit me together in my mother's womb. I praise you because I am fearfully and wonderfully made. Your works are wonderful. I know that full well. And here we go. My frame was not hidden from you when I was made in that secret place. When I was woven together in the depths of the earth, your eyes saw my, hold on to this next word, unformed. That's important in church history. Your eyes saw my unformed body. All the days ordained for me were written in your book before one of them ever came to be. You get the same meaning here. I can keep going with Scripture after Scripture after Scripture, but hopefully you're getting the point. When we look at Scripture, we can see justice applying to the unborn. We can also see that God knows the unborn, um, and there is that sanctity of life that you see there. Let's move on into the early church. In the early church, there is a, a document called the Didache. It's the teacher. That's basically what it means, didactic, okay, teaching. Uh, the teacher or the teaching. This was a book that was written around eight. AD 90, which is about 60 years, okay, 50, 60 years after Jesus uh, would have died and ascended. Uh, and this document was basically written to itinerant evangelists, to pastors who would go out around uh, different towns and villages sharing the gospel. And this book was written to kind of give them the, the manual of how to live and how to disciple people. Okay, this is what it is. It's one of the earliest documents we have. In chapter 2, in verse 2 of this document, this is what we read. Thou shalt not murder a child by abortion, nor kill them when born. Killing them when born basically refers to the practice of exposure. That was where a parent may give birth or have a child, uh, an infant, and then they would take that child out into the wilderness or into the edges of the city. They would place them there, and they would leave that child die. By the way, church history records that many Christians would actually go out there, pick that child up, and bring them into their home. But you can see this from AD 90. This is unequivocal. It is absolutely clear what the early church thought about abortion. Now, let's move on from this into church history. I could quote so many examples of this, but for time, I'm going to note three. Firstly, we have the apostolic constitutions of the fourth century, which basically talk over and over again about abortion being wrong. Then we have Clement of Alexandria as another example. He spoke about this openly, said abortion is wrong. The one I want to cite for you, though, is a guy by the name of Athenagoras, and this is interesting. This is about 177 AD, so about 80 years after what you're looking at right now. And Athenagoras was asked to give a speech to the emperor Marcus Aurelius and his son Commodus. Uh, basically, the accusations were going around that Christians were kind of violent people and they were, they were killing people. And so, uh, Athenagoras had basically been invited in to give a speech showing that Christians were nothing like that at all. And one part of the speech, as I've said, just focused on the, the accusation that uh, Christians basically would kill people. Well, this is how he responded to that accusation. Have a look at this. What reason would we have to commit murder when we say that women who use drugs to induce abortions commit murder and will have to give an account of it to God. For the same person would not regard the fetus in the womb as a living created being and therefore as an, ob an object of God's care and at the same time slay it once it had come to life. I love this last line. We're altogether more consistent in our conduct. Now that's pretty graphic. Wouldn't you say? But it's also pretty clear. Whatever you think about abortion, Scripture is clear. Church history is clear about its application and its understanding. Let me give you one more example. Let's jump into the Reformation. I talked about the Reformation uh, last week in that period. You got Martin Luther, you got Ulrich Zwingli, you got uh, John Calvin. Uh, Calvin, in his commentary on Exodus 21-22 that we just read, said this, I'm led to conclude without hesitation that the words, if death should follow, from that text we read, Exodus 21, must be applied to the fetus as well as to the mother. 
Whether this, in my opinion, is the meaning of the law, that it would be crime punishable with death, not only when the mother died from the effects of the abortion, but also if the infant should be killed, whether it should die from the wound abortively or soon after its birth. In other words, Calvin is saying, I understand this right for justice to apply basically to the unborn child as well as to the mother. So again, Reformation period, we see the same thing. So whether we are looking at Exodus and how the Hebrews interpreted this, whether whether we're looking at the early church in AD 90, whether we're talking about 177, whether we're talking about 400, and we can keep going all the way through to the Reformation, all the way after that, there is one clear and consistent message, and that is abortion is wrong and it's been opposed by the church. That's the clear and consistent message. Now, again, there are some parts of the Bible that are so clear they're uncomfortable. And let's be clear, in the context of uh, political conversation, the clarity of the Bible is uncomfortable. But what do you do when the Bible is so clear about something? Church history has been so clear about something. What do you do with that? For some people, they ignore it. But a biblical faith doesn't ignore what God is clear about, however difficult it is, and however politically incorrect it is to accept it. There are aspects of the Bible that I find difficult. But where the Bible is clear, my thought must submit to God's thoughts. That's why I see that. So, clarity leads to consistency. What is clear, what is consistent is that abortion was always considered to be wrong. Okay, great. That's fine. I get it. But what was inconsistent then? Well, when you look at church history, what we've discovered is that the proposed penalty for abortion has always been inconsistent. The proposed penalty for abortion has always been inconsistent. Now, to understand why this is the case, and this will lead to a really important application, but to understand why this is important, I need you to think back to last week's message. In last week's message, I talked about the church in the state. I talked about, for example, how the Catholic Church believed that the Pope had uh, the two swords, right? The sword of the state and the sword of the government. I talked about how Ulrich Swingley basically saw the church as a spiritual entity, and since it was a spiritual entity, Church discipline matters, lifestyle matters, leadership matters, morality, okay, justice was ultimately a matter for the state. So when it came to the church's position on how to categorize abortion, it was made more complicated by the fact that the church and the state were often like this. It's often inseparable, inseparable. And so the conversation in history revolved around how grievous a crime was abortion. All of them agreed it was wrong. But what do we do about that wrong when exercising discipline, judgment, justice for the baby because of the wrong that's been done resulted not only in being punished by the state, but excommunicated by the church? Following it? If the church and the state are intermingled like this, when the state passes judgment, the church does it. And so there were long periods, okay, of history um, in in the church where if you had an abortion, you were excommunicated. But then in other periods of church history, there The Catholic Church will call it a grievous sin, and a grievous sin basically means that you can repent, you can confess, and you will ultimately be spared damnation. See, there are mortal sins, there are things that you basically die from, and there are other sins that you can repent and you can be forgiven over. What's inconsistent throughout history is how the church could proclaim that abortion was wrong, calling sin, sin, but at the same time, practice the fact that abortion is not the unforgivable sin. That God's grace and God's mercy is still available to you. Think about this from a scriptural context. Is murder the unforgivable sin? It's not. Around 330 AD, 
to 3, uh, 3, uh, 306 to 337, Constantine was the, uh, was the Roman emperor. He moved the, the seat of the, Rome, uh, of the empire into Constantinople, which is Istanbul today. And when Constantine was the emperor, he relaxed the regulations on abortion. He relaxed them. That led to people like Basil of Caesarea coming out and making really strong statements. This is what Basil said. Basil said, listen, and Basil was 330 to 379, so there's an overlap of a couple of years here, okay? Roughly the same period. This is what Basil said. The hair-splitting difference between formed and unformed, I'll get there in a second, makes no difference to us. Whoever deliberately commits abortion is subject to the penalty of homicide. Subject to the penalty of homicide. Now, if church and state are inseparable, the state says you are guilty of homicide, what happens? <laughs> well, you get locked up for this, right? But you'd also get booted out of the church. That's communicated. Basil recognized, he made this statement, and some people, pro, uh, pro-life people, by the way, they quote Basil, but they, don't, they ignore the context of the application. Basil said, hey, there's no difference here between abortion, okay, and homicide. And yet, Basil recommended that a person who kills someone is basically excommunicated for 20 years, But someone who has an abortion is excommunicated, is basically kicked out for 10 years because there were subtle differences with abortion. (laughs) So you've got this, you've kind of got these bold statements coming out here, but at the same time, you've got these people trying to work out, wait a minute, we're, we're basically kicking people out of the church, and therefore we're pushing them further away from the only person who can ultimately forgive them and redeem them. This has been a constant tension. How do we call sin, sin, but love the sinner? And when it comes to abortion, and this is the application, we have got this sadly wrong. So let me ask that question again. In the context of church history, in the context of biblical history, did homicide, murder, Pull, push someone away from the call of God on their life. Think about Moses. Moses killed an Egyptian. He knew the consequences that were coming to him, so he fled. And God still called him. Think about David. David was pursuing his call when the last for Bathsheba overtook him, and he basically arranged for Uriah, her husband, to be murdered. He was confronted by the prophet, and the prophet called him to task. David repented. Did that exclude him from the rest of his call? No. Let's go to the New Testament. What about Paul? The apostle Paul was there when Stephen, the first Christian martyr, was murdered. Paul says that he was a part of this, and yet God still called him. You see, wherever you look at this scripture, homicide never presented someone from receiving forgiveness full and free and ultimately pursuing the call of God on their life. We recognize that with biblical stories, but for some reason, the history of the church makes it so difficult for women who've had abortions to experience that same grace. The church has been inconsistent. It has struggled in how to call sin, sin, while loving the sinner. And by the way, I think that that is a terrible term. Oh, we just just hate the sin and love the sinner. Do you know how impossible it is for someone who's dealing with something like this to accept something like that? The church has historically struggled with how to categorize this. By the way, in uh, 1588, which is just after the time of Calvin and Zwingli, Pope Sixtus V made the penalties for homicide and abortion exactly the same. So previously, around Calvin's time, they were treated differently. Then he made them exactly the same. Three years later, 1591, Pope Gregory XV repealed that penalty that made them exactly the same and said the penalty for abortion only applied to the sold, I'll get to this, the sold fetus. In other words, we struggled with this over and over again. This is my point, right? Throughout history, 
the church has struggled to present abortion being wrong while at the same time presenting the message that God's forgiveness is full and free. Statistically speaking, realistically speaking, there are people in this room today who have experienced or had an abortion. The shame and the guilt that people feel having had an abortion and then come to faith in Christ and to understand this is the history is massive. And sadly, when we talk about issues like this, we ignore the reality that the history of the church has always struggled to balance this message. Listen to me, church. In this period in American history, where abortions have been so rampant, we must learn the lessons of history. We must make sure that guilt and shame that people feel is good guilt, not bad guilt. What do I mean by that? When you feel guilt and shame, good guilt forces you to do something with it. Now, for some of us, what we do with our guilt and our shame is we bury our head and we run away. But what we believe the right thing to do is to confess our sin and to receive forgiveness full and free. That, that's what we do. And, and then when we confess that sin, Christ forgives us fully and freely. Toxic guilt is completely different. Toxic guilt makes the mistake of replacing, I made a mistake, with I am the mistake. There is no way that God could ever forgive someone like me for what I've done. That's toxic guilt. And when we are so strong on the message of wrong and so weak on the message of grace, we pour toxic guilt and shame on people's heads in a way that does nothing to help people know God's forgiveness and God's freedom. Listen to me, if, if you're here and you're feeling guilt and shame over something you've done, whether that's abortion or not, I point you to that cross and I encourage you to realize that if it were true for David, for Moses, and Paul, that after what they'd done, God could forgive them, then there's nothing that you've done that God cannot forgive you. Receive that forgiveness fully and freely in Jesus' name. And as believers, let's make sure that in this current climate, we recognize the struggle the church has always had to balance calling wrong, wrong, while advocating grace and freedom. And if you want to know what that looks like, you need to go to a Celebrate Recovery chip ceremony on a Monday night because people go to the front and they say, my name is John. You heard it earlier on. I'm an alcoholic. Um, I am a growing believer in the Lord Jesus Christ celebrating what? Victory over my alcoholism and my drug addiction. And you know what people do? They applaud. They're not celebrating the sin. They're not taking it away from them. They're ultimately recognizing that when we acknowledge our brokenness, we can experience the love and the grace of God and be transformed. You want to know what that's like? Celebrate recovery is the place to do it. But I really believe in this day and age, we need to learn the lesson of the past. What's been inconsistent actually provides an area of conversation for us all. How do we deal with wrong while demonstrating God's grace and compassion? Last part of this. Where has theological conversations forced the church to evaluate where they've drawn the lines? Well, the theology of what is called delayed insolment, okay, formed and unformed, fueled the debate about early abortion. Remember what they're grappling with. They're grappling with how do we call sin, sin, while basically acknowledging a lot of the issues around abortion. How do we deal with all of this? Now, let me just explain this, because this is an important part of church history. The church debated from a very early age when a fetus became a person. 
the theological concept they're grappling with is, surely the human soul needs a formed body to live in, right? That's the theological conversation. What needs to be formed in order, f- in order for the soul to make its home? So many theological conversations on that one. Is the person the soul? Is the soul a part of the person? Years, centuries of church history on this. Okay, theological conversation. That's what they're grappling with. And so one concept in the early church from a very early age was the idea of quickening, that the, the fetus became a person when the baby moved. When the baby moved, then the, then the fetus is a person. Okay? The second idea that was, was banded around is the idea of insolment or delayed insolment. Again, the idea that the soul wasn't there initially at conception, but ultimately came a, a little while later. And then the conversation was how much later? So you have people like Augustine, for example, who said the formation was completed 46 days after conception, but he couldn't exactly put a finger on when the soul made its home. You've got people like Aristotle and Aquinas who basically said, sorry about this, ladies, the soul made its home in a man after 40 days, and if you're a woman, you had to wait 80. It took twice as long for God to actually form a soul in you, right? That's basically the... Uh, by the way, is, Islam has a similar idea. In Islam, it's about 120 days or 19 weeks. These numbers sounding familiar to you? A, a lot of the conversations about abortion and early abortion and the legitimacy of it actually were debated in the church. Now, let me make this pretty clear. Let me bring it up to date. The church has obviously clearly and throughout history unequivocally said abortion was wrong, yet the debate around when a fetus underwent harmonization, what a term, right? Insolment, delayed insolment, quickening, and now harmonization, right? Humanization, if you want to put it that way, okay, was ultimately used to allow some to distinguish between an early abortion and a later abortion, and with an early abortion, penance could be given because that's grievous. If it was later, it's mortal, you're kicked out. You understand where this is going? They're trying to work out the interaction between church and state, and they're using theological reasons in order to do it. But some of these conversations are precisely the conversations that are being used right now to justify certain types of exceptions. Do you understand where I'm going with this? And the problem is, even a lot of pro-life ministries don't actually dig into history and tell you this. And I want our faith to be an informed faith. If we're going to be a part of a conversation, let's actually have an informed conversation. Let's just realize that the church debated for centuries, how do we draw the line here? Because there are certain situations like rape, like incest, like when the mother's going to die, that if an abortion is homicide, what do we do? How do we deal with this? How do we justify this? Can we justify this? This was debated in the Catholic Church as well. So in 1869, Pius IX abandoned the concept of the sold fetus completely. Right? 1869. It was debated for years, and then in 1869, Pius IX basically said, okay, I'm abandoning this kind of concept of when the soul basically makes its home in the body, basically its life from conception. 1930, Pius XI said that there was absolutely no ban on abortion at all, and that's where the Catholic Church has been since then. And that clarity has actually meant that the Catholic Church, after the federal government, are the largest organization providing support and ministering in that pro-life arena, and I commend them for that. But that's a hundred years. Let me begin to apply this. Key question you've been asked to consider on November the 8th is, are there exceptions? There are commercials going around about the uh, exceptions for rape and the death of a mother which certain people are not uh, basically in favor of. Now, each of you need to make your own decision. I'm not a policymaker. I am not a politician. I'm basically a pastor. I'm a teacher. And I want to show you how church history has dealt with this. Why? Because this has always been a biblical issue. Let me just say this, though. On the case of these exceptions, 
I believe there is tremendous power when a woman takes the evil, the hatred, and the violation that has been done to them and carries a baby to term. As a man, I will never be able to understand what that costs psychologically and emotionally to do. But the choice to allow life to grow from evil is the most powerful decision a person can make and represents an expression of the gospel. In the first service, I shared about Stephen Holland. You may remember this. I put a video up last year about Steve Holland. Steve was on my staff in Tampa. He was adopted, and then as he was um, just on our staff, he felt that he wanted to try and reach out and find his birth mother, and, and he did. And I remember the day well where we all gathered around Steve and, and we prayed for him. We laid hands on him as he was going up to Georgia to try and find his mom. It turns out he did find his mom. His mom was actually in a psychri psychri psychiatric hospital and had been there uh, even when Steve was conceived. Steve was conceived because she had been raped. The hospital wanted to abort the baby, but I don't know how, but even in her limited intellectual, with her limited intellectual capacity, she just knew that was wrong, and so she ran. She lived on the streets until the baby was born and then gave the baby up for adoption. Steve was that baby, and I'm telling you, the moment where Steve meets his birth mother is one of the most powerful videos we've ever seen. I will never know what it costs as a man to carry a baby to term, but I do know this. The decision to allow life to come from evil is an incredible hallmark of the gospel. After the first service, uh, I had about four or five people who came up to me and said, that's my story. That's my story. I don't know where you stand on, on exceptions, but you know where I stand. But here's where I'm going with this. These emotionally difficult exceptions are being used to champion a vision for family and society that differs from historic Christianity. It's called Proposition 3. Now, Proposition 3 has been touted as necessary law because it allows for exceptions that conservatives won't tolerate, but history does. But that is not what Proposition 3 is. Proposition 3 does not restore Roe versus Wade. It actually goes radically beyond it by abolishing, for example, parental consent on abortions for minors, by abolishing the ban on partial birth abortions, by basically uh, ending the ban on state-funded abortion. It's not even about health care because the word woman isn't actually mentioned in the text at all. Individuals are. Planned Parenthood helped to write this policy. Go on Planned Parenthood's website and see what an individual is defined as. It is a person of any gender and of any age. Here's the upshot of this law as it's written if it would be approved. My daughter could be raped. She could go to a counselor at school. The counselor could advise her to take an, get an abortion. That counselor could take my daughter to an abortion. She could have an abortion or sterilization because it's reproductive rights for that matter. And as a parent, I would not have the right to know a thing. That is not an exception. That is an extreme interpretation that puts Autonomy above lordship and autonomy above justice, and that is anti-scriptural. And that's the only reason I'm speaking out about it. I could talk a lot more about this, but it's not my point. My point is that there are people who use history and exceptions to gain a foothold, to take things to an extreme. And you may say, Craig, why do you speak about stuff like this if you're not a politician? Here's why. The church has always spoken out and clashed with the state, strong church, in matters of ecclesiology and justice. Ecclesiology, lifestyle expectations for its members and its leaders, and justice Exodus 21, protecting the rights of the weak and the vulnerable. That's why I speak out on this, because the church, and you've seen it for 2,000 years, have always done this. So what do we do with this? 
Again, my goal, as I've said, is not that we basically become political. My goal is ultimately that we get back to the heart of what the church is called to be, and that is the bride of Christ. My goal is not that abortion becomes impossible. My goal would be that abortion becomes unthinkable. But for abortion to become unthinkable, I think it needs to become two things. Firstly, this abortion issue needs to become a gospel issue. The abortion issue isn't a legal issue for a Christian. It's actually a gospel issue. See, when I accept Jesus Christ as my own personal Savior, I am making Him Lord over my life. That means I no longer sit on the throne. Christ sits on my throne. That I live and orient my life after Him, and I, through the Holy Spirit, discover God's will, which is in God's Word, and is revealed to me because I'm a son of God. That means that I place my right to control my life under God's right to control my life. Pro-choice is pro-autonomy, but you cannot be pro-autonomy and pro-Christ. It's a lordship issue, which basically means it's a gospel issue. When Vipka was and Vipka and I lived in Germany. Vipka has a medical background. She worked in a gynecologist, a, a, a women's doctor, and, and she would come home sometimes really distraught. And obviously, confidentiality, HIPAA laws means I never knew anything. But I would say basically, hey, are you okay? And she said, no, Craig, I just cannot believe that people treat abortion as birth control. I just can't believe that people think abortion is birth control. And it would really disturb her. When we would have conversations with people about this and, and they weren't saved, we would tell them our sexual ethic. Look, sex belongs inside a marriage, and marriage is between one man and one woman. I know that's not popular, we say, but that's basically the way that we, we think about it. We were called so many things, old-fashioned, out of date. Then I looked at them and said, look, if the price of being up to date includes accepting abortions as birth control and minimizing the justice for the unborn, then I will always be out of date and out of fashion because God's word has the right to command both my belief and my attention. Now, the, the basic point of this, right, is that all of this conversation points to the fact that there is a very different value system that is driving the way a lot of people are trying to lead the nation. And it also points to the fact that the historic doctrines of the church are ultimately considered to be, what, unjust. But Martin Luther said the gospel cannot be preached without offense and tumult. Heart change is needed, Luther believed, and I do too. For any of the Bible's values, sexual ethics, to basically be believed. I remember Vipka and her mom telling me a story. We, uh, Vipka told me that after she became a Christian, she went to her mom and said, I've become a follower of Jesus. None of her family was saved. They thought she was completely insane. Um, and uh, Vipka started to share her faith, and it was not received initially at all. And then in one conversation, Vipka said to her mom, Mom, just for you to know that I'm not going to have sex until I'm married, and at which point uh, her mom just laughed at her laughed at her, ridiculed her, told her how stupid that was. A number of years later, Vipka's mom came to faith in Christ and went back to Vipka and said, do you remember that conversation we had about this? Now it makes sense. Why does it make sense? Because when you order your life after a relationship with God, every other relationship changes. But it's only when the heart changes that our approach to relationships can change. And so my encouragement is for us to recognize that for abortion to be unthinkable, what we need to be praying for, what we need to be working for, is for the gospel of Jesus Christ to be boldly proclaimed and wisely proclaimed by His people so that hearts would change and then behavior changes.
Because behavior changes inside out, not outside in. Lastly, I think for abortion to become unthinkable, we need to recognize that abortion is also a justice issue. This is a challenge for the evangelical church. I believe it's a mistake for us to view the question of abortion simply as relating to morality, people's lifestyles. It certainly is that, but it's more than that. It's time, I think, for the evangelical church to take the Catholic's lead and to realize that some pregnancies are unwanted because there is the inability to provide adequate support for the woman who wishes to carry the child to term. The task of believers is to offer viable alternatives. The Catholic Church has been leading the charge on this for so long. And I think the Catholic Church can truly say our position on abortion is ultimately a pro-life message. But for many of us, because we refuse to acknowledge the social issues around carrying babies to term, we are not pro-life as much as we are pro-birth. And I believe that what needs to happen in the evangelical church at this point in time is a real embracing, not of a pro-life message, but of a pro-life ministry. And for that to happen, a number of us need to deal with another tension. Our ideology of small government versus the need to support women carrying children to term. Because friends, that costs. How does your small government, low investment strategy help or hinder mothers carrying babies to term? This is not sociology. This is ultimately ideology versus theology. In Michigan, I think we have a lot of work to do to provide abortion alternatives This is not the end, I believe, of the pro-life movement, but it needs to be the beginning of pro-life ministry. Let me wrap all of this up. Abortion is a difficult topic. It's one we need to be wise about, but it's one we need to understand the history of the church is fundamentally clear on. Abortion has always been wrong. But... In holding abortion to be wrong, we need to be mindful that the church has always wrestled with how to present sin as sin while still offering the grace and the forgiveness of Jesus fully and freely. We cannot be so focused on the wrong that we drive people into hiding. Thirdly, we need to recognize that whatever you think about exceptions, these exceptions are being hijacked to basically introduce a philosophy for life that is a radical departure away from the Scriptures. And on November 8, all of you are basically up, and you will determine where that goes. What I would say to you is pray, do due diligence, and think, but be informed. Lastly, I would say this. If you are here and you are wrestling with guilt and with shame, my encouragement to you, bring it to Jesus fully and freely and receive his grace. Let's pray together, shall we? Let's pray. Oh, Father, I thank you so much for for your grace that's full and free. I thank you that this is love, not that we loved you, but that you loved us in our fallen sinful state and sent Christ to die for us. Father, there are moments throughout history where The church has clashed with the state on matters of morality, church discipline, lifestyle expectations. And in Michigan, this is our time. And I just want to pray for each and every one of us that you would give us wisdom, that you would give us courage. I pray, Father, that we would be known as a people of the book, a people who love the Word of God, who are informed about history, who recognize the tensions, who engage in conversations, who recognize that wherever we draw the line, people are going to challenge it. But in all of that, Father, I pray that we would be a people 
we would continue to proclaim the gospel of Christ. I pray that we would continue to be a people who look out for the, weak, uh, for the needs of the weak and the vulnerable, both the unborn baby and the mother struggling with the reality of what it will cost to bring the baby to term. God, in all of these things, we thank you for your Holy Spirit that gives us wisdom, that gives us just that sense of your presence. May we live courageously, wisely, and empowered by your Spirit to make a difference in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Thank you all so much for being here today. Hope um, you will take the sermon questions. Remember, versus vs at centralholland.org. If you have any questions, we'll be taking those questions in a panel on November the 6th. I'm sure there could be quite a few you'd ask me on this one. But uh, I hope you have a great week. Thanks for being here. Uh, stay blessed and see you soon. God bless.